I was talking to a senior person at one of the big fund funds, like the you know, $10 billion kind of fund funds. They said among their managers that next year, the re-ups will be 5X this year. One of the real skills that we've developed as a secondary firm is the ability to underwrite companies before we meet the CEO. When you're a secondary buyer, the company does not care about these deals getting done. Typically, they're not gonna be like, here's my 10 customers. You wanna talk to customers? You gotta find customers yourself. The last decade was like the golden age of venture. Like it, it was incredible. We're the bell of the ball. We're the best asset class that's going. And I think it's gotten really hard again and you're gonna have to have people that really love it. Ben, uh, this is a long time coming. Uh, I'm excited to, to chat. Welcome to the 10X Capital Podcast. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Most people know, but not everybody knows that you run one of the largest LPGP conferences, actually the largest LPGP conference in the world. Tell me about the race conference. Happy to. Ironically, people know me more than that for, than for my day job running Acadia Adventures. Not what I intended, for sure. People know people know me more for, for my <laughs> podcast, so <laughs> I, I know how it feels. It's good. good. It's good to be known for something, right? So uh, Absolutely. Yeah, no, about uh, 10 years ago, I started a, a conference called Raise, and originally it was intended to be a conference for fund entrepreneurs, like all about how do you, like, I got some of the best fund entrepreneurs, like Kate Mitchell from Scale and uh, Phil Black from True Ventures. We all got together talking about how do you start a fund and go from nothing to institutional capital. But I quickly discovered that what people really cared about, what VCs really cared about was just raising money. And so the, the quickly, the, the conference morphed into a GPLP event where the GPs get to come. Uh, it's, you know, invite only a very select group of GPs get there and, and they, we get 20 to 30 GPs on the stage every year in front of, uh, uh, gosh, over 300 LPs. And then another 70 GPs get to participate in other form, in other secondary areas. And really it's just about, man, I want to create the best place for GPs and LPs to get to know each other in like an authentic, real way. Uh, and so now we've been doing it for, this is going to be our ninth year this year um, in the Presidio on October 24th. Um, applications for GPs open. Uh, in June, and uh, uh, so be able to look out, and you can just go to Raise Global, uh, uh, just Google Raise Global Summit, and you can just go sign up to get to make sure you get invited to apply for the conference. How much have uh, GPs raised that Raise conference? It's a little hard to know exactly because it's got two things. One is GPs do not like responding to surveys; like they just don't like it. You know what I mean? So we get like doesn't it doesn't lead to money. They're not going. Yeah, I know. It's like so we get pretty low. So we, we always do these follow up surveys, constantly searching for uh, for for uh, LP commitments. Last year, the LPs are better at actually saying what they did. So last year, the LPs that attended had made in total 180 commitments to raise managers um, in, in the previous years. So it's kind of aggregated up, um, you know, and I hear, you know, fundraising, as you know, is a very, very long term game, right? Like you may meet somebody in 2018 at raise and not actually raise money from them until 2000, you know, till, till 2022 or 2023. So it's hard to know, um, uh, but, but we know it happens. We know it happens at good scale. Um, last year, you know, of the 100 funds that attended, they had raised about $8.3 billion of capital in their existence, and they were in market to raise about $5 billion more uh, last year. So that gives you a sense of scale of the funds. Um, but the important thing is it, it definitely works. Like, you know, I get messages all the time from people saying, oh, my gosh, Ben, you know, I, I met my anchor GP in Fund 2 at Raise when I was just doing my Fund 1 four years ago. And because this is where relationships start, like this is the goal, right? We want to start GP and LP relationships and we want to build those relationships between early uh, emerging managers and LPs early, as early as possible, uh, so that everyone can sort of uh, find the relationships that they want to build. I want to double click on that for a few reasons. I think a lot of people look at fundraising as episodic versus continual. You know, you have fund one, fund two, so you have these kind of natural episodes. but. There's a couple of things there that are important for GPs to, to understand, and most LPs intuitively understand this. One is you have to start the clock on the relationship, just like VCs look for the slope, not just a point in time. LPs also look for that. They're looking for, is that GP doing what they said they were going to do? How are they evolve? Are they learning? Are they, yeah, they might be making mistakes. Are they, are they improving that? Um, the second aspect is I think uh, GPs and LPs are both deciding whether they want to get in a relationship. It really is a two-sided relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, to, to use our romantic relationships, you could have a toxic GP, you could have a toxic LP. Uh, so you, you want to also be vetting your LPs as well, make sure that they're the right partners, make sure they have the right values, make sure they understand the, the asset class. But you've seen you know, hundreds, if not thousands of these marriages what makes a good marriage between a GP and an LP? Boy, you know, it is it, it is a marriage. And I, I, I do think that that is the, probably one of the best analogies you can have. But I mean, at, at the core, like, you know, what we've seen at Raise is that the best, the GPs that do are the most effective at fundraising. And we've seen more than 2,000 funds come through Raise since the beginning. Like, you know, that, and, you know, I've met at least six or 700 of them in person, right? 
and the best, the people that do the best job uh, view fundraising as a, as, as like farmers, you know, they start small, uh, they start educational, they, they get to know people as people, they add value to the LP, um, and they aren't just out there pounding against a, a list and looking at it as a numbers game. I mean, I've seen small funds be successful with just pounding away, uh, but I think it's really, really, um, you know, ultimately negative uh, because people just get so tired of it. You know what I mean? And like I, every year at Raise, you know, we can tell within our, we have a portal where GPs and LPs can, can, can connect. And I can see, you know, when GPs you know, ask, try to hit every single LP that's going to come without any just, you know, discerning between like who's a good fit and who's not, you know? And if you're, if you're a $20 million seed fund, one seed fund, and you're reaching out to a pension, like that's just a waste of time for everybody. And, uh, and the best fundraisers, the people that do the best are, are, the, are, the, are the managers who just spend a lot of time really trying to get to know the LP in an authentic way and adding value to that LP, whether it's through education or events or connections or doing something that enables them to create a, a relationship before you ask for a check. The people who just pound and look at it as a numbers game, I think ultimately it's very self-defeating. And I think that they don't have great LP bases because, you know, they just happen to find somebody who, you know, in the moment, uh, uh, you know, sort of took, took a meeting and if we do enough meetings, we're going to get to our fundraising target. And I, I get it. And I, I'm empathetic to it, but it's, but it's really exhausting. Like the LPs do not want to be hounded by people that haven't even read, you know, what the LP strategy is. And I see that happen all the time. What is the smartest way that you've seen GPs provide value to LPs prior to investing? It's all around being highly informational. I mean, I think that the GPs who are able to really educate LPs about an exciting new area, um, you know, I saw this in the early days of AI uh, with some AI focused funds who were really out, out in front um, of this and being like very, very sort of controversial and, and insightful uh, in their efforts to fundraise. I really liked, uh, we we're one of the, the managers that came through raise is Jazz Venture Partners who, who have a whole fund around human performance. Fantastic fundraisers. I mean, absolutely fantastic fundraisers. And they were able to really build connectivity among, they had a really amazing set of original LPs and they were able to leverage the, those really created a lot of good relationships between LPs. And that I think has you know done very well for them. Um, and that those are, I mean, it's people that like, uh, especially when there's something like brand new, you know, we had like three space funds last year for the first time, you know, you see a lot of new things. And then the people that are going out there and educating about new spaces and being highly educational. So they're doing dinners, they're, do, they're doing, ex, you know, they're interviewing experts, they're bringing LPs in, you know, and giving them really unique experiences. And it's hard work. I mean, here's, here's a question for you, David. I always ask this question to GPs that I think are really good fundraisers. I always ask, how much of your time do you spend fundraising versus working on investments or your portfolio companies? Of the best fundraisers, what do you think it is? <laughs> it's a controversial question for, for, for several different reasons. Um, let me first sidestep that question and then I'll, 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 <laughs> while I think of an answer. Okay. For me, a lot of people think that podcasting takes a lot of time. And what they don't realize is I don't do any fundraising outside of podcasting uh, for, for different reasons. One is I enjoy building the, the two-sided yeah. relationship. I'm vetting the LP as much as they are vetting me. So yeah. I'm able to basically go through that. I'm also learning instead of pitching. So I yeah. get to learn from uh, from LPs instead of having to pitch to them something that I already know. Um, so to me, it's more of a re reallocation of my resources in terms yeah. of fundraising. Um, this, in terms is really, of, this is a really good mousetrap. Like this is a really great fundraising mousetrap. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, which is they're... You know, when we they're first yeah. yeah, there are different mousetraps and the, just like a business, you want to be differentiated and you yeah. want to dominate some niche. So, you know, other people, there's a lot of people that try to do VC podcasts. It's just such a saturated space and it's difficult to uh -huh. get in front of it. So you have to be novel in how you scale, scale your platform. But I would tell people to do the unscalable. I've seen a lot of interesting uh, mousetraps. I've seen people that put on amazing events. I see people that write books. All these things are things that take a lot of time, mm -hmm. but they provide unique value and most of the best models that I know are scalable, meaning this podcast, thousands of people listen to every episode, even though I yeah. put in a lot of effort into it. So it is actually much more scalable than it would appear. Yep. No, it makes, it makes all the sense in the world. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, one, one fund that comes to mind is that has a really great event is uh, Peter Sonderling's uh, uh, Zero Prime. He, he runs the Data Council. And the Data Council is sort of the preeminent place where, like, the best of big tech software engineers and, and uh, uh, you know, go and sort of ta try to tackle their biggest data problems. And he gets to meet... Like, this is not really his, you know, this is how his deal flow gets, but like, it is a really amazing VC mousetrap, like, because he's gets to meet the most incredible technologists in the world through this conference. And LPs, you know, love that. Another fun that I really like for the, for like, sort of what they can do for their LPs is E14, which is kind of the dominant fund that focuses on uh, MIT. And when you, when you go to see them, like, they bring to bear 
the, all the coolest projects at MIT into one place. When you can expose LPs to that, that's like catnip. Like, because you are seeing the future, you're just like, wow, this is the future. And these guys are right in the middle of the epicenter of it. And it's it's a really cool, you know, event uh, for, and really insightful. Any LP that's going to go in there, I was. I mean, I'm like cynical. I've been doing venture out here for years. I just went like two weeks ago. I was like, this is amazing. Uh, and, and that's a really good example. It's interesting with the race conference, uh, what a moat that is. It's a network effect business because every year you guys get bigger. Every time you start, you start with a critical mass of LPs and GPs. And I think I would, I would advise VCs to be thinking about themselves like they would think about a startup. What is your competitive right. advantage? What is your moat? Uh, ideally you have network effects, you know, what's your differentiation? What's your branding? All these things that ironically, a lot of VCs don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't think. On. One of the most, you know, unintended consequences. I wish I could say I had all this, you know, was, I just saw this all happening, but a lot of this happened organically. But like now we had 700 firms apply last year for hundred spots, right? It's really hard to get in. We have a panel of amazing panel of 30, uh, 35, you know, institutional LPs like Northwestern and, and uh, San Jose retirement system to like help us select the top hundred funds, right? Which is really hard. And it's a lot of work, but what people don't appreciate is like the sheer amount of learning that you get from being a participant in this because VCs, what do they do in their decks? They say, this is the new exciting area that I'm doing. And you get to read 700 decks in a very short period of time. I can actually never read them all. Like I, I poop out about 350. It takes me like two weeks every August. The learning that you get just from sitting there and watching VCs like one after another pitch, watching another present and meet, meeting them all. And they're all talking about what's exciting. It is, it, it's a, it's a forward looking indicator on what's going to happen. Like you know, one year, you know, back before you know, early in the conference, you know, all of a sudden we had like 14 LA funds pop up and there were no LA funds back in 2014, 2015, all in 2016, it was like 14 of them. And that really was an indicator of what was going to happen in LA and how they all blew up. You know, uh, one year, you know, I think 2017 or 18, we had like 11 AI focused funds. I was like, what is all these AI focused funds? Now, now there's like 150, you know what I mean? And so early trends, I mean, this business is all about spotting trends early, right? And it's an incredible platform for that. And it's something that people just don't appreciate when they look at it from the outside. Oh, all these VCs are trying to raise money. No. They're there to educate you on what is going to happen. And that's why an LP should be in that room. They should, this should be the day that they go see everything. Because it's like a, it's like a year of networking in one day. Essentially YC, but for funds. Right. Absolutely. I remember the first time I went to my YC, to your point, I think on the 50th or 60th presentation, it was the first time that I actually, you know, uh, was getting a little bit tired from seeing startups. I'd never happened before. I was always able to process very quickly. And I'm like, wow, like this is actually, there is actually a capacity to how much yeah. information you could, you could process in a day. Yeah, no, it's definitely true. Uh, I'm curious, you, you bring in 100 out of 700 funds. What differentiates the 100 that you bring in from the next 100? So, I mean, I think that you know, we've, we have tried over the years as, as the steering committee, which sort of de determines the rules, and that's much bigger than us as we have a bunch of great people involved. Uh, to, we've, we've manipulated and like worked on trying to like have the perfect mix of criteria, right? Like early on, it was very focused. It was overly focused on track record, which meant that you got much more mature emerging managers. And that was just because like track record is kind of the easiest thing to glom onto. Like, you know, and so, you know, we consider an emerging manager, anyone at 200 million or, or less of AUM. So these are pretty substantial. These are, you, know, you can be pretty substantial at that point. We found that that frankly was a little bit under optimized because we wanted to see the amazing fun ones and the people with incredible backgrounds. So last year we changed the criteria, but what makes it the key thing that, that differentiates the funds that get in versus the funds that don't is this. The funds that get in ha have a clear reason for being, okay? Like they are, they have a clear point of view. They have a, they're a clear strategy that's well articulated. And they're not just like, I think if it's just being a C generalist with a good guy with good connections, that is something that gets, that, that you just get too many of them and it's hard to tell the difference. Um, these are people that have created an ecosystem around their funds. We, we look for ecosystems. So we, we want to have firms that have a clearly defined ecosystem of, their, of people, of talent, uh, we look for people who like can show they add value in a very clear way. Track record helps, but but we've de-emphasized it because we're, because we want those people who have incredible uh, uh, sort of lives of achievement. Last year we had like ten or twelve fun ones that were just had no track record. Just people were starting funds who were just had done amazing things before. And at the end of the day, like you know, you really do want to create a day where there's a lot of diversity of managers and strategies. So um, you know, for, I think one of the best things that people do is when they can point to like having like a really great conference or event or a book or something that distinguishes themselves from somebody who's just got a good network and write checks and is in Silicon Valley. That's the big, the second thing that really is important that people underestimate is just the professional quality of the, of what I call the core information in funds. Like, you know, these are not, these should not be sales documents. These should be like professional, sober track records. And at, you know, if you left a big firm, you should have attribution, all the technical parts of, of presenting a fund that professional LPs look for and expect. So many emerging managers just 
they just don't pay attention to details and it just comes off as unprofessional and kind of, you know, not ready for prime time. And, and like, if you don't submit a track record and you were at a big firm or you had like, you know, prior funds and it's not done in the industry standard way that you'd expect, you're going to get done. You're not going to get in. And that is like very clear differentiator. What is, what is the industry gross net multiples? What oh, no, I'm not saying it's a number. I'm just saying like, you know, okay, but for example, like an unprofessional deck will say something like, oh, this fund, which is currently at a, you know, 1.2 X, you know, gross moik, you know, projected 5X, you know, with a big like red arrow up into the right. Like yeah. professional LPs just throw up all of that. They, they literally make fun of those kinds of pr presentations. Like yeah. you want to see, you know, a track record that's laid out, you know, company, date of investment, security, uh, you know, cost basis, you know, realized or unrealized, you know, ret returns, percent, like, and, you know, IRR, and then by, by line, like you want to see, it, it drives me like batty when I see presentations that just talk about gross moik, multiple investor capital. Like you have fees, you have costs. We, we, we see through that, you know what I mean? Like, and, and you just look really unprofessional. It, it just, and people, the, the, the reviewers just be like, that's a zero, that's a zero, that's a zero. And people, good firms do it all the time. Good firms think that they're like, sometimes firms think that they're too good to put their track record information and they want to be private and secret. That's also not going to work. Like people are like, there's, because there are other good firms that are putting their numbers in. And there are outstanding funds that get in just the basis of their numbers. If you got a six or seven X fund and the fund one, you're raising fund two, you're getting invited, right? But there's lots of funds that get invited who don't have great returns because they have a great deck, they have a great story, they're building a great ecosystem. And it's something that LPs can hold on to and be like, I can see why this is going to be successful. And I appreciate the honesty of the complete presentation, even though not all the information is good. Sounds like you guys are almost looking for a post NDA deck for, for the judges. Oh, totally. They should, you should treat all, by the way, you're going to get your information read by some of the best LPs in the business, like, you know, legit LPs, right? And so treat them like they're LPs, you know what I mean? Like holding back information and being secret is not going to accomplish anything. I an LP, we, we have an NDA before you get into a data room and I'll be very upset by that. How, how common is that to have an NDA going into a data room? I sign them all the time. I, to me, it's just like, you know, part of the process it doesn't bother me at all. I mean, when I'm looking at funds, you know, it bothers me now, you know, if you try to, you know, if you have an NDA that you require raise to sign, we're not signing that because like, I'm not managing all those relationships. Right. And no. this information is going out to a committee. Like I'm not, you know, but by and large, like I, we've been doing this for, I've never ever had any complaints about an LP misusing information that they've received through the application process. Nine years, never happened. I mean, we've had other complaints. We've had LP, LBs do terrible jobs and like obviously not read the decks. <laughs> they, yeah. they don't write it back. Then we have then we have an absolute fire drill at the end where like I'm like I need somebody to read 25 decks. Who has who could do this tonight? <laughs> and that's not very What are you looking for from your LPs? From the oh, panel? just you know something. We try to make it so easy for you. We give you like a standardized criteria list. You just have to read 25 to 35 decks and give a, and give your best estimate. Uh, you know, there's always subjectivity, but what what we can see is like people who who just like either rate everyone like really bad or, or really great because they're trying to like influence things one way or the other, like trying to put their finger on a scale. And then we end up just kind of discarding those. The biggest problem I think we, we have is that when you're dealing with like big institutions, like, you know, multi-billion dollar um, fund funds, you know, sometimes the, you know, I'll, I'll get the big partner who'll agree to do it, but really they slough it off to an associate. Um, and that just happens. And then we can kind of see, but we normalize all the scores. I've got, you know, the guy who introduced, who, uh, you know, who introduced us, Eric Sippel is one of our raters. He's my number one, most favorite rater, he's just great at it. And so like, actually, whenever we have issues about, we see like, if one reviewer is very high, another viewer is very low, we actually have those decks read three more times. We, we do everything we can to like clean up the data. This is a volunteer activity. We do everything we can to make it really good and really fair. Um, uh, but you know, it's, we're human. Investing in funds is extremely subjective, right? Like it's, it's, it's a very subjective exercise. So you're going to have differences. So you're going into your ninth year at, at raise. How predictive has your uh, judging been to who's ended up being breakouts? It's, that's a really good question. I, I've never gone to look back and been able to say like, has the judging been predictive? I would say that, you know, firms have come through raise that have been you know, very early on that have gone on to do absolutely great things. And there have been firms that have rated really well that, you know, hit a wall for one reason or another, especially, you know, sort of fun one people that get in because they have really big resumes. It's one of the surprising things about Ray's is that I've seen is that like spin outs, people who spin out from big firms think they're going to have an easier time than they do. They, they're coming out of Lightspeed or Kleiner and they're doing the fund as a solo DP. And they think that that, you know, they are the most likely to underperform and find it really hard to raise money. If they leave and they spin out and they're like, I'm look at this track record I, I have from, you know, big firm, insert the name. So often they are so shocked at how hard it is to raise fund one. 
and they're shocked because guess what? They didn't own the LP relationships when they were at those big firms, you know, and they just find it really hard. And uh, they're the ones also because their expectation is that it's going to be easier because of their resume. Um, and I'm always like, so you left this amazing job you had without any LPs, like saying, I'm in business with you. Like, you know, and then people do that. Right. And they look around and say, well, this person did it. And I'm better than that. And, you know, and, they, and then yeah. they're like, well, you don't know that person had 600 meetings, you know, I mean, fun ones. I, I, Availab availability bias. They only see the headlines that work. Yeah. Why is that? Is that, is that hubris? Is that lack of LP relationships? Why is it that somebody, let's assume they have an attributable track record at you mentioned Lightspeed or Kleiner, why would it be difficult for them to race? Well, because like I go back to what we said at the beginning, which are LP relationships are built like marriages over years. And you have to do that, you know, 50 times, right? And an LP who's in Kleiner 10 or whatever crazy number they're up to, right? Unless I, you know, I question at those firms, like how much exposure do the, you know, non, you know, managing directors really get to, to a lot of those LPs. And I think it is a lot of hubris. It's a lot of thinking, you know, those people who have, who have done, gone to those big firms has never failed at anything typically, right? They've had like golden careers until then. And then they say, oh, well, it'd be great to run my own shop. Um, and they just have never, you know, if you've never raised an LP dollar, you, you don't understand how many choices LPs have. You don't understand how many spin outs there are. You don't spend it every year at raise. We probably have, I don't know, 25 tier one, you know, VCs who are spinning, spinning out trying to raise fund one or fund two. 25 out of 100. 25, no, 25 out of like out of 700. 700. Yeah. How many of those 25 get in? I, I've never looked at it. Um, they definitely get in at a higher rate than the general audience, for sure. Like, I would say three times more likely to get, to get in conference. And like, when they don't, I mean, the, the people that, when they don't get invited in year one, the people that I hear from, like, how the hell did I not get invited to this? And look at all the other people that are here. Um, that is always, it is that is the most common fact pattern. Like, there is somebody who was a partner at a big firm, and they didn't even get the top hundred. And I'm like, I can't tell you, like, you know, you're, you're, you're not as special as you think, Like, you're just not, there's just a lot of choices. I mean, think about this. There's like, how many version managers are there? There's like 2000, you know, yeah. in total, right? Some people think as much as 3,500 3, to 4,000. Right. So I don't know what the number How many of those, how many of the two to 4,000 emerging managers are still going to be around five years? Five years. Well, you know, around is, and they made it a, a defined as it made an, a new fund, that's new fund that has dry powder. powder. I think less than 30%. 35. I love emerging managers. Like we've done so much business with them on the Acadian side and, uh, and you know, so much of my personal connectivity is with emerging managers. And, um, I'm obviously like a huge believer. I mean, we did a, a big data analysis last year that said that basically looked at 2000 fund returns and we're like, okay, you know, if you were going to find a 10 X fund in the emerging manager marketplace, you almost only have to do, you, you can only really do fund ones, like 80%, 80% of the 10 X funds of the people who have come to raise were in fund ones, right? I'm a huge believer in that you have to go like you, you know, in, in emerging managers that said the amount of money that's being, you know, uh, focused on the mega funds compared to like, you know, the ever shrinking pie. And I haven't seen the latest numbers and, you know, so I, I'm, a, I don't, I think I'm just got my head in the sand on this. But last time I looked at it, it was like, you know, I think the $12 billion was raised by emerging managers in, in 2021. And, you know, I think we were on a run rate as of Q1 for like 1.2 this year. That's bad. Another fact that is just sort of like highlighted how hard it's going to be next year, because next year is going to be the gate. It's the great gate. Fund one to fund two? Yeah, fund one for any emerging managers, fund three, fund four, you know, yeah, fund three to fund four, like just emerging managers raising new funds. I was talking to a senior person at one of the big fund of funds, like the, you know, $10 billion kind of fund of funds. And, um, they said among their managers that next year, the re-ups will be 5X this year. And the number of requested re-ups, right? Right, the number of requested re-ups, exactly. So if you think about everyone hitting the market next year at the same time, it's gonna be a brutal year uh, for everybody. Like LPs making hard decisions and GPs, you know, pounding their head against the wall. And yeah, you know, I think then, you know, you can always kick it off a year and try again, like these things do have a way of stretching um, and hoping that you get returns. And right now, the biggest problem is like, the returns in early stages don't look very good, like across the funds that we're looking at, right? So like with the lack of growth rounds, like there's been very, very few growth rounds that are giving big up rounds because of 2021 hangover. And that means that the early stage guys aren't able to show the level of progress that they did in the past. And if the early stage guys can't show great numbers, they're not gonna raise new funds. So it, it's it's all part of the same system. And we're like, we are like, you know, an anaconda that ate the antelope called 2021. And the industry as a whole is trying to digest all the, all the, capital that came through 2021 and you know and we just got to survive to get through the other end and we need an ipo market and some exits to make the numbers look interesting to bring investors back uh we just did a series of, of raised dinners in boston and new york we we're just talking to lps and like they were just kind of saying 
uh, just venture is not very much on their minds these days. They're, they're, they're focused on their public. So they're focused on something else. You know, it's just not top of mind. And that's, that's rough for the industry. Um, but there's a lot, but we have AI, which is super exciting. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. A lot of endowment, foundations, institutional investors, um, most of the smart money is very interested just because they're, they're counter cyclical, they're contrarian mm -hmm. nature. Yeah. But a lot of the, the followers and, and the yeah. ones that always complain about not being able to access funds, a lot of them are not interested. So I totally, and that, and that is, there's a trade-off there. That is a great correction that, you know, that, that, that you, and I think that with raise kind of managers, you're always looking for like, where's the net new dollar going to come from? You know, we've seen success. Uh, managers have success with RAAs, you know, that are under allocated to venture. We've seen a fair amount of success with, with managers going international. Um, in fact, we're starting a series of events, international events with Raise. We'll be uh, hopefully back at Slush. We did Slush last year um, and we, we're going to do a raise in, in Costa Rica with, for LATAM family offices. Super. I think that's going to be really great for the industry and, and try to like get, get, get away from this sort of traditional LPs in North America that I think are going to be much harder to access next year. How do you both uh, run raise as well as Acadia? And tell me about how you, how you split your time and how, how do you build a team around you? My, I have very understanding partners uh, on, on the raise because, and um, you know, this is, this is not a for-profit thing. We, you know, we lose money on this every year and, um, and you know, Acadian bank bank rolls it. I spend traditionally I probably spend 20, 25 percent of my time on raise, 20, 20 percent. Um, I just hired a new guy, uh, a new guy to run raise, a guy named Scott Dubin, who uh, has come over from uh, Learn Capital. Um, and so I'm very happy to have like for the first time like a general manager to to run this whole thing, which is gonna be amazing for me. That's that's an exciting moment as we sort of try to scale this up. Um, but uh, you know, it's it, but then again, like we did we at one point when my partners were kvetching about the cost and my time and distraction, um, I, uh, I, I was able to uh, go back and show how, how many of our investments at Acadian had come through relationships that started at Raise, and that stopped the conversation pretty pretty quick. So it's a great thing. I mean, it's great for the firm. It's a key competitive advantage for us. And the, I mean, the, the access and the information and the, the, the relationships we get, I mean, they're, they're the best. And so, you know, that, that's something that, that I think that the firm sees and they're understanding, but like my goal is to get it down to like, like 10 to 15%. Tell me a little bit more about Acadian. Acadian is one of the OG uh, uh, direct secondary funds. I uh, started doing direct secondaries back in 2010, when I think we did our first $136,000 deal. Uh, and, you know, really started around like back when, you know, I was like educating people that like direct secondaries were legal um, and doing mostly like little tiny uh, positions. There wasn't insider trading. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, you, I mean, you wouldn't believe like, back in, back in 2010, people just don't remember this. Like you only did secondary when like the founder was, you know, litigating with the company because they got pushed out and, you know, and the, and there was the only way to get rid of them was to buy them out. Uh, you know, and then Facebook happened, right. And the whole secondary market just kind of blew up around us. Um, and so we evolved the firm from direct secondaries to uh, option exercise loans, whole company liquidity programs. Uh, and, you know, now, you know, we view direct secondaries as very much a service business where like we, we start working with a company, like, you know, we work with Splunk, DocuSign, RingCentral. Um, and we, we go in and say, like, let us help you, uh, you know, take care of all the problems on your cap table. Like, let's just clean up, clean up. Let's just, people have issues. Companies are private for 10, 12, 14 years now. You know, you're going to need, you're going to have lots of problems. If you want to have a partner who can take care of all that. Um, my partner, Mike Dinsdale, uh, was the CFO of, uh, DocuSign, DoorDash and Gusto. And I worked with him at DocuSign and at Gusto. And so he just saw the value of that, having that kind of like very service oriented partner in his pocket. So when people had it, when anyone had an issue, they, you know, want to buy down payment on the house, call Ben, you know, you need to pay a tax bill, call Ben, you know, and, uh, those types of relationships are our best. We're currently investing in our sixth fund, um, and uh, that is a, a $300 million vehicle. It's a, an interesting and complicated time for, for secondaries, for sure. Um, good values to be had at part, but also a lot of overhang for 2021. It makes getting deals done really hard. Um, and, you know, like everyone, we're sort of waiting for the IPO window to open up and have get some exits going again, because the whole industry, you know, it, it, well, it's getting definitely better. There's a lot more bidding. Um, there's a lot more buyers in the market. And so you're starting to see prices come up in, in a lot of names. Most of it's still really concentrated, like the 15, you know, big names that everyone knows. We don't do those. Um, you know, we mostly come in between Series B, Series C, start pretty small, and get to know a company really well, and then sort of aggressively, uh, you know, expand our position in, in, our, in our two or three best companies. We'll get right back to interview. But first, to stay updated on all things emerging managers and limited partners, including the very latest data on venture returns and insights on how to raise capital from limited partners, subscribe to our free newsletter at 10xcapitalpodcast.com. That's www.10xcapitalpodcast.com. Tell me about your own firm building. You're in six fund, $300 million. How much easier has that gotten over time from fund one to fund two, fund fund three? Is it, has it really gotten that much easier or 
Tell me about that evolution. Yeah, I, I don't think that it's ever got, I don't think it's ever been easy. Um, I think, I feel like we've always just been, it's always, you know, being a fun entrepreneur is, is, you know, I think people really underestimate how hard it is and how hard it is to keep it going. I don't think it's that hard for persistent people to get fund one, fund two up. I think by fund three, you have to show DPI and real numbers. And by, for fund four or five and six, you have to show that you can develop long-term in, in, you know, LP relationships. Um, I, I absolutely did not want to have a big firm. Um, I didn't want to spend my day managing people all the time. And just like, and I, I liked being close to the, to the action. And I liked being, I liked having a very small firm. I, big partnerships are just unwieldy. I think you see so many partners that are like four person partnership blow up because managing all those personalities is really hard. So I was a sole GP for fund one, fund two. I brought on a partner for fund three, fund four. I went back to being a sole GP because I just, that was the, the right thing to do at the time for a whole host of reasons. Fund five. And then when Mike Dinsdale, uh, when he quit being a CFO, it was just kind of like, oh, wow, this, it was a really good friend of mine. Um, and he's somebody I'd like love working with and I just love him as a person. And uh, he, uh, when he was trying to decide what to do, I was like, man, he had raised like $2 billion of, of, you know, venture from every big growth fund under the sun. And I knew all these emerging managers I said, man, the two of us together, we got the industry covered, Different but we could stay small. We could stay really small. You know, like, you know, there's, we're a two person investment committee, right? Him and I just have to agree on deals. There's, we have a wonderful team, but it's small. And, uh, you know, we've, we're now growing for the first time. We're not growing. I mean, I've been at this for 14 years before I'm finally letting it grow. Um, so I've been a very slow fund entrepreneur. Like there are firms like similar firms to mine that have gone much bigger than me. And sometimes I look at that and go, gosh, I'd love those fees. But then again, I don't know if I'd want to run them. So, <laughs> so really, like, I just want to be happy every day, man. I want to do, I want to work with who I like working with. I want to have investors. I love, you know, I have investors that have been with me now for 16 years. I have investors from my seed fund in 2007, uh, who are like dear friends and, uh, that's the way I want to live my life. It's not about size, it's about quality. We were talking offline, you were saying you could tell who, who will be a good fund entrepreneur versus a good fund investor. First of all, what did you mean by that? And second of all, tell me the difference. I think what I was saying was slightly different than that maybe came out, but what, what I was saying, like, I've noticed after looking at 2000 firms, this one trend that just strikes me, the funds that execute the best are usually a combination of a great fund entrepreneur and a really solid investor. Sometimes that could be like one person. Uh, but what I mean by that is like, most of the great fund entrepreneurs have been operators, like really good operators. You know, I think like quintessential, you know, story is like watching Fifth Wall, like Brendan Wallace, like he was an amazing operator, entrepreneur. The execution of that business was epic. You know, we, we, he came through, raised like fund one and just was like, wow, like the speed of execution is super impressive. Or I feel the same way about base 10, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, one pure investor, one former operator fund uh, like an entrepreneur, but again, like the execution, the operational execution of those two funds were, you know, just fantastic, like top, top tier. And so when I see that uh, operational excellence get paired with a good investor, like that's where I see the people that are able to create truly institutional platforms, like very quickly. Um, I, I, I don't know a lot of funds that have reached like institutional scale, uh, just based on people who have only been investors. I, I, they're almost always entrepreneurs on the team, you know, and like, I think of from like NFX, it's like all, all operators, like the beginning of that firm. And I, 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 you know, I don't follow it that closely so more anymore, but like they, they got up so fast, you know, in the, in the operational excellence, at the beginning was, was really apparent. Um, and so, you know, those, those firms were those great operators get involved at, at, in the creation stage. I think they probably overdid their strength. Uh, they they yeah. realized that starting companies was very hard to scale. Yeah. And I think they went to a fun model. They're on the yeah. record for that. So, so sometimes the strength could be, could be, could be too strong. Just, just to unpack that a little bit, why does a fund need a fund entrepreneur? And what, what exactly are you talking about? Is it just fundraising? Is it, is it something else? I talk about the strategic execution of the fund from day one, you know, like, like, like people who have, like, like they realize that, um, they're going to create an ecosystem around their firm that you can see. Like, I think fifth wall is like a perfect example, right? Like very clear purpose. They got the best LPs in the business that, that decommoditized their money. If you were doing a prop tech deal, now we can argue, you know, prop tech's been up and it's been down, right? Like hard, right? Yeah. But the execution of that from day one to say, you know, say fund four was insane, like am amazingly impressive, you know, in my, in my book. Fundraising, built, sourcing, developing an edge, developing a brand. Brand, all of it, all the things that go into building a firm that's, that's bigger than the, than the founder is. And that's fun entrepreneurship. That's what I mean. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I mean, I think that Mark Suster with Upfront, like amazing fun entrepreneur. Do you know Logan Allen from Finn? Uh, I know Finn, yeah, yeah, but I, I don't. I mean, he came through. They came through raised at some point, but I, I don't know him well. But yeah, they're one of the most conscious and thought out venture fund family strategies I've seen. Uh, I've gotten to, to chat with him, and just the way that they developed everything, they know exactly how, where every investment goes, who's the team, what's the strategy, what type of LPs, that kind of like firm building. Yeah, you know, that, that's that's the first person that comes to mind. It's a great example, and like 
you know, the people that do that well tend to be, in my mind, they tend to be people who have built really great businesses outside of VC, the VC fund. The business building is is, is an art into its own. Um, and fund entrepreneurship, and really, like, that was my original goal with, with Raise, ironically. It was like, there's if you have an operating company, there are so many places that you can go to, like, learn how to build an operating business. But if you're a fund entrepreneur, there was nowhere to go to build. Like, how do I, how do I build this? How do, all the parts of it from, from fundraising to investor relations, to team building, to sourcing, to ecosystem building, you know, to, you know, information advantages. Um, there was no place to go. Now, ironically, I kind of wanted the conference to be all about that. And then the market told me that that's not what they wanted. They wanted to just talk about fundraising. Yeah. You listened to your customers. <laughs> I did. Well, I mean, the product market fit was crazy. I mean, when we first had this room, that was just empty and we just like threw 10 GPs in the pitch LPs and everyone in the conference went jam into that room. I was like, okay, well, that's what you want. So, you know, uh, but it wasn't what I wanted. <laughs> they didn't want corporate governance. How to pick a yeah. back office, you know, how to compensate venture partners. Our listeners are very sophisticated. So they, yeah. they'd love to hear about all that. Between um, tax distribution and allocation, like how many people do that? When should emerging managers think about fund building? Is it from the first fund? Is it as they go from fund one to fund two? And why? Why? Explain that. I say why, because like it takes a long time. And look, if you're going to start building a ship, just start building. You don't just start with a rowboat. You like start building the outlines of the ship you want to build. Um, I also think that like the, the, the earliest that you can start building the thing that is going to make you different and stand out and give you a competitive advantage, the better off you're going to be. Um, I see way too many people just think that being a VC is about writing checks, right? And like, they don't think about brand strategy, ecosystem building stories. Like, you know, you, you should be able to explain why you're different and why you're, what your competitive advantage is from day one that you're, even if you don't, you know, you haven't built it all yet. Uh, at Acadian, you, you have, you've built this incredible network of emerging managers. How do you like to partner with emerging managers? Uh, well, you know, so we, we have started doing some fund investments that's new. Um, so we are doing some, some of that now. And so we're finally now out of the fund or PA yeah, uh, out of, out of fund. Um, and, uh, we have, we have a separate vehicle now for that, um, which is great. And, uh, so we're doing that, that's very traditional. It's very easy. Like the, the emerging managers that we do the best kind of treat us like we're LPs, even if we're maybe not. And they know that like a lot of times our entry point in working into a, a growth stage business is was through the, uh, through the GP. So for example, you know, we collaborate, collaborated with Nadave Loth to build a position in a company called Placer. Nadav is awesome. And like, I'm a personal investor in his fund. It's the largest actually fund investment I've ever personally made. Um, and I, we, and we love him. He'll come to, basically the good emerging managers come to us and say, Hey, look, Ben, we, I've got this company. I love, uh, you know, we're, they're going out to do a series B or series C, um, you know, do you want to maybe collaborate on it? And, uh, and then we go do all of our sort of due diligence, um, on our own. And then we come back before the rounds even started. And then we like make a big commitment, uh, in partnership with that emerging manager more than pro rata, like something like in the five to $15 million range. Um, and for the emerging manager, they get all this, they get a single purpose SBV with, you know, they don't have to raise any money for it. They just, you know, we back them. Um, and those, you know, we've done that a number of times and it's worked out really well for everyone. When do you want to hear about those opportunities? Uh, ideally th three to six months before the round. Three to six months. Yeah. We so want when to there's a sure path into a round, but yeah. enough time to do full diligence. Right. And then we do, but then we do it like very quietly. You know, we, we, we don't involve the company. We never want to look, make anyone look bad. One of the real skills that I, we've developed as a secondary firm is the ability to underwrite companies without actually ever meeting before we meet the CEO, you know, or before we get involved with a company. Like when you're a secondary buyer, the company does not care about these deals getting done. They are not there. You know, typically they're not going to be like, here's my 10 customers. You yeah. want to talk to customers? You got to find customers yourself. You got to find experts yourself. This skill ends up being really important to the strategy. Cause like we showed up to a company like Placer, like we had already made the decision. We wanted to do it. Then it's just a matter of like, boy, we made that seed manager look like a hero when he starts before the process has even begun, he's like, I'm in for 10. You know, that's great. Yeah. Like follow in. Like it's and, flex. Yeah, it's total flex. And then who are they like, that creates like a lot of momentum into the round. It's an amazing signal, right? For everyone. And everyone wins. The other hand, like we've had to say no. Like one of the challenges, like I have worked with a virtual manager that's shown me two or three deals. And you know, any deal, it's it's always hard. Like getting to yes is always hard, right? Like, you know, and there's good companies which we pass on for all sorts of reasons. And then, then you know, you do two or three deals and then they're sick of showing you stuff and that's, that's the downside of it. So, so you try to manage those really carefully. And sometimes, you know, I'll be a personal, I think I'm a personal investor in like 17 funds. I think Mike is in 40. You know, a lot of times we see, we just are following these funds and we say, we really like this company. We'll approach the manager and say like, hey, you know, I, I want to go do this. I mean, this is like something that Greenspring used to be really good at. Like they were just very, they were very on top of their portfolio companies of their managers. They came in very strongly and said, I want this one. I want that one. And we're trying to kind of do the same thing. You're managing a lot of relationships. You have your race conference, you have your LPs, you have your emerging managers, you have the 
you have the underlying companies. How do you manage all of your relationships? Tell me about kind of how you prioritize, how you rank those. Well, I, I start, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the most important uh, thing with Acadian is, is that I've really, as we have grown a lot in the last few years and we will continue to grow, um, is uh, coming at it first from a servant leader kind of or, approach. That's kind of with everyone where it's like, I try to approach these relationships like, like how can I make your life better? With, our, with the team on Acadian, what can I do to make your life better? And that's, I try to do the same thing with managers. Like I spend a lot of, I spend a lot of time coaching and counseling managers, especially those that are frustrated with fundraising, which is most of them, or have firm problems with like LPs. I, I just realized that in, in, at this point in my career, I'm in a pretty like honored position of this, like having seen so much over a long period of time and coming at these relationships first with that kind of service orientation, which is also try how I try to come at the companies is like, how can we be of service? Um, and everything else sort of flows from that, in my view. Like if you have that attitude, you know, good things happen over time. The primary attribute I think of, of being a VC should be enormous patience and enormous empathy for everyone involved. Because like building businesses to successful outcomes, investing in them, you know, systematically is really, really hard. And, you know, I think we had this period of a time where it felt easy. I, and I think that like the managers who joined in 2018 or 2019 and then just had like the most incredible run and now it's really hard again they're spoiled we did an event um called uh like surviving the downturn it, like that we did at the chase center um with jp morgan and i had like all these vcs that had, uh, to be a speaker at that conference you had to have survived uh 2000 and 2008 and had, so you had to be in business in the 90s right so i had all, all these amazing like vcs who had been there and done that and getting up and talking about and they, you look at like how bad the returns were from 2001 to 2007 Right. And then who could have foreseen like the last decade was like the golden age of venture. Like it, it was incredible. We we're the bell of the ball. We we're the best asset class going. Um, and I think it's gotten really hard again. And you have to have people that really love it. And a lot of the a lot of the mercenaries are, are not going to be here. And the missionaries, people who just love this, that can't help but build things, um, they're going to survive. And so, you know, I'm just really thankful that I'm still going at six funds. Like, you know, that that, that in and of itself is, is something that I'm very thankful for. And the fact that I've been able to survive so many mistakes and share those mistakes with others is, is a real honor. Very curious. Has your career as a VC been really about one or two really large outcomes? Has that defined your career? We've had some, some big outcomes, but I mean, the, the one that I'm known for mostly with my investors is DocuSign, um, because that, you know, we, we invested a lot of money and at a pretty early and, uh, you know, that, and then it went to 300, you know, we distributed at 45, we bought at seven fifty on average and distributed at 45, which is a really good outcome, but it's not that easy. Late yeah. state, that was like series B entry point. Yeah, it was a pretty, yeah, about series B, yeah. But then it went to 300. So people were like, Ben, this is unbelievable. You just bought me two houses, like, you know, and that was amazing. But will I ever see a company that in, you know, 18 months goes from 45 to 300? I don't know, that was a pretty unique time. Yeah, that was uh, the Zerp, Zerp yeah. trade. Yeah, Zerp trade. <laughs> Everybody had one of those in their portfolio. Yeah. Uh, well, Ben, this has been like a one hour conference, one-on-one <laughs> -on -one conference and a masterclass. Uh, what would you like our, our listeners to know about you, about Ray's, about Acadian, any, anything you'd like to shine a light on? For an LP, the most impactful day, we want the most impactful day of your year to be the Ray's conference. And for a GP, we want the most impactful day of the year to be the Ray's conference. And so our, you know, we wish that we wish that we could figure out a way to do it for more GPs. And that is that's really hard. And then like, you know, if, if you have anyone you know if you have any companies where you really want a, a secondary partner that's in that's in the that's not there just for a transaction but there to make your company better you know we'd love to talk to you excellent well thank you ben thank you for taking the time and uh, look forward to meeting up in bay area or new york very soon that's great. Yeah, great thank you david really appreciate it for more ideas on how to raise venture capital in this market make sure to subscribe below